is the coelacanth still considered a living fossil? Welcome back to part two in the series. Uh, since I'm going to be diving right in, I would ask that you go back and look at part one to begin with, otherwise you're not gonna have any context for what is going on. You'll find a link for part one in the description. So the fourth solution seeking to explain evolutionary stasis in living fossils is to fall back on the philosophical underpinnings of evolution itself. In other words, since Darwinian evolution is true, and since 400 million years of time have passed, then organisms alive today cannot be closely related to those that lived 400 million years ago, even if they share a very close morphological relationship. And this is the hypothesis put forward in this paper by Cassane and Laurenti. In order to make their case, Cassane and Laurenti compare Latimeria with its closest known relative, Macropoma, which is supposedly 70 million years old. Based on the skeletal data, they argue that Latimeria shows substantial anatomical divergence so as to support their hypothesis that the two genera are in fact not closely related. If that is true for Latimeria and Macropoma, then it is also true for all ancient coelacanths, Diplosocetes included. Again, go back to part one if you are not following along. Let me show you why I disagree with their conclusions. Let's start with the postcranial anatomy. In other words, the skeleton from the neck backwards. As you can see from their own diagrams, Latimeria relative to Macropoma has a longer vertebral midsection, but a shorter post-anal region. The hemal arch, which is found at the bottom of each vertebra, has thin spines that run downward. In Macropoma, you can see that these spines are longer than they are in Latimeria. In the skull, Cassane and Laurenti point out a number of variances, too many to discuss individually here, but you'll notice that in nearly all of them, the differences are minor and almost always pertain to aspects of bone thickness, length, slight changes in shape, with minor changes in dentical ornamentation on the premaxillary bone as well. But notice that the variations here are minor, and this is really, really important because the authors are trying to convince us that Latimeria, when compared to other older coelacanths, is so different that it cannot be called a living fossil. And yet other paleontologists disagree. Consider this quote from a paper published in 2006. Evidence of the minor evolutionary change observed in the coelacanth can be found in its skeleton. The skeleton of the extant coelacanth is almost identical to that of Macropoma. Emphasis is mine. As it turns out, all of the morphological differences that we see between Latimeria and Macropoma can theoretically exist in the same species, let alone the same genus or family. Consider the variation that we see in different dog breeds, all of which consist of a single species. For example, here are the skulls of an English bulldog, a Great Dane and a Chihuahua. Notice the incredible plasticity of form that exists just across these three breeds. Every bone in both the neurocranium and the face of each dog is different, sometimes varying greatly. The diversity of form that we see in dog breeds hasn't escaped the notice of evolutionary researchers. In this paper published in 2010, the authors used the skull variation in dog breeds as a proxy for macroevolutionary thinking in higher taxonomic ranks, and they said this, our analysis show that the variation of cranial shape in dogs is comparable to that across the entire order carnivora, and that differences in skull shape between extreme dog breeds even exceed the maximal distances we found among the species of carnivora. This massive disparity among dogs has evolved in a few hundred to several thousand years, a very brief time span. Charles Darwin observed similar degrees of morphological variation among various breeds of pigeons. He said this, <coughs> In the skeletons of the several breeds, 
The development of the bone of the face in length and breadth and curvature differs enormously. The shape as well as the breadth and length of the ramus of the lower jaw varies in a highly remarkable manner. The number of the caudal and sacral vertebrae vary as does the number of ribs together with their relative breadth and the presence of processes. Altogether, at least a score of pigeons might be chosen, which if shown to an ornithologist and he were told that they were wild birds, would certainly, I think, be ranked by him as well-defined species. Interestingly, this single species of pigeon not only displays, as Darwin puts it, enormous differences in the shape and size of individual bones, it also exhibits varying numbers of ribs as well as caudal and sacral vertebrae. Yes, dogs and pigeons have had their genomes manipulated by human selection pressures, which obviously differ dramatically from those pressures associated with natural selection. But in both dogs and pigeons, these dramatic changes occurred in just a few thousand years. And according to Drake and Klingenberg, in dogs in only just a couple of hundred years. These two coelacanth genera, although not experiencing powerful selection pressures from humans, have, however, experienced 70 million years of supposed mutations and natural selection in an ever-changing and dangerous environment. In light of these observations, the anatomical comparisons of Macropoma and Latimeria put forward by Cassane and Laurenti actually serve to show that these two taxa are surprisingly similar, especially when we're told that they've supposedly been evolving for 70 million years. Cassain and Laurenti also extend their hypothesis all the way back to the pectoral fin of a supposedly 390 million year old Devonian coelacanth. To view my response to their interpretation, you'll find a link in the description that will take you to my article that fully ascribes that interpretation. After all, there's only so much I can fit in a 10 minute video. But let me give you the heads up here. The fin of this supposedly 390 million year old Devonian coelacanth, although showing a greater degree of morphological disparity to that of Latimeria, well, it's still clearly a coelacanth fin. And this is important when we are told that the first dinosaurs evolved from a small group of reptilian ancestors that then flourished and diversified into very unique groups such as the sauropods, theropods, ceratopsians, stegosaurs, ankylosaurs, hadrosaurs, and more, and then went extinct. And all of this, we are told, occurred in less than half the time that the coelacanths prowled Earth's oceans, while also remaining virtually unchanged. A fact that doesn't get any easier to swallow when we consider the additional 200 million years of coelacanth existence that transpired before the dinosaurs even came on the scene and the 70 million years of existence that passed after the dinosaurs went extinct. To find out how to put all of this together into a cogent creationist apologetic, join me in part three, where I'll bring this series to its conclusion. So that's all from me, Ken Colson here at Creation Unfolding. So if you were in any way blessed by this video, then please go ahead and hit that like button. I'd really appreciate that. Also, subscribe and ring the bell for easier access to more videos as they pop up. Uh, look, I've got a website as well, www.creationunfolding.com. You'll find more resources there. Uh, I've also got a book, of course, if you're interested. And look, I've got a new donate button, a PayPal donate button, which you'll find in the description as well. Uh, look, the most important thing, though, I think is prayer. So if you could spend a moment right now and just pray for me, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you and goodbye.